Gaga. Hi, Lynn Manuel. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Um, I'll ask the first question. I'll get us started. Um, this is this is your first big movie. This, and I feel like you're someone who has created your own opportunities and created this incredible career. So, I guess my question is actually not so much what was it like, but what was it like, sort of trusting. Bradley Cooper and what was that relationship like? Because when I watched the movie, I'm just like, wow. You know, I, I I just really trusted him instantly. I mean, we had an instant chemistry from the first time I yeah. met him when he came over to my house. Uh, it was amazing. And, you know, I just felt really ready uh, at this point in my career. You know, I wanted to be an actress before I wanted to be a musician, even though I was sort of doing both simultaneously yeah. as a kid. Um, you know, and I trained a lot. I went to the Lee Strasberg Institute, and I worked at um, uh, doing workshops at Circle in the Square. Oh yeah. Uh, and I, you know, also you know, Adler Technique. Uh, so you know, I felt ready for this. And then when I met someone that I felt really had such a strong vision, like Bradley, you know, uh, such an incredible collaborator. Uh, I was like, this is it, this is the one. And I, I just felt really ready. And yeah. I, I felt so good about it. I think that's what I feel when I watched the movie was like the incredible amount of trust and the thing that every movie tries to do and very few get right, but I felt sort of coming off the movie in waves is like the trust between you two and the ease between you two. I was like, these people are falling in love in this movie. And yeah. it really feels so uh, genuine. I mean, what? What, how'd that happen? Like, what did, I, I'm curious as to how um, you, you give over that trust and how, how sort of Bradley prepped you, because he's a first time director as well, but right. he's obviously worked with incredible directors. Well, you know, at the end of the day, the, you know, the way that I work as an actress is I have my like deck of cards, you know? And I, I feel like when, now looking back on my career, that I created all these characters for each of my albums yeah. because I was not an actress uh, and I wasn't in movies and I wasn't uh, yet working on television like I did uh, with American Horror Story. So, uh, you know, I created kind of this, you know, these characters for myself. It was like the uh, outlet for it. Yeah, I was, yeah, I created the star of my own movie uh, <laughs> right. that I was going to star in and that was it. Yeah. Um, but um, with this particular situation, you know, Allie is really not like me at all. Yeah. And uh, she did, didn't believe in herself. She wasn't, you know, creating a character in order to, uh, you know, uh, get to the places that, that she wanted to go. Right. And she really gave up on herself and she was, you know, singing in these drag bars. Um, uh, to uh, you know, have one place uh, as her musical outlet, and yeah. uh, but in terms of their love together, you know that was real. Uh, you know, I became her over a period of time. The the music that I was writing and working on yeah. uh, for the film was being created simultaneously while the script was being written and the film was being casted. So those were all written before you started filming. Uh, yes, some were, yeah. and some were actually written while we were filming. Wow! So, I, like, I would uh, actually the the scene the scene in the cop uh, bar yeah. uh, where I, I, I knock the guy out. Uh, you know, right after we shot that scene, I went back into the Sprinter van, and I was on my way home, and I was writing uh, the song. Um, uh, what's the name of it? Uh, the song from the wedding scene, I Don't Know What Love Is. Yeah. And uh, that ended up being in the film. Uh, so, you know, it was very simultaneous. And so, you know, the truth is that when I have created characters on my own through my music, I have complete control. Right. But when you're dealing with a script, right, and all these collaborators and costume department and, you know, props department and uh, set design and lighting and producers, you know, you have to collaborate with other people. And so I really kind of had to just take off all my makeup, dye my hair brown, go in there in the studio and start from vulnerability and yeah. start from nothing, start from naked. And the reason that I think it was so easy to fall in love with Bradley on camera was because of the people that he brought together. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the people around 
me, the people around him, the family that he built, it was just so filled with trust, that exact trust that you said, that it, it just, it makes it feel so easy, you yeah. know? And then what happens is, is you take that deck of cards that has all of that, um, you know, information about, you know, trauma or, you know, alcoholic relationships and codependency and, um, uh, the the family dynamic of someone that's grown up with a you know a father or mother who has alcoholism you know you you kind of pull from that deck of cards and there's a sorcery that happens when you're off camera and then as soon as you get on stage or when you get on set and you start to film you know, you sort of throw that out the window but you know that the alchemy will still be there and yeah. be with you and uh, so you know, that's that's what I think really happened. I don't sing my own songs. Thank you. Why? Um, well, because, like, almost every single person that I've come in contact with in the music industry has told me that my nose is too big and that I won't make it. I'm interested to know, for you, you know, because you did everything for Hamilton. <laughs> I mean, that that was all you. And, and in many ways, I feel like there's a similarity between us yeah. in that. In doing Mary Poppins, like, how difficult or different was that for you to be singing someone else's songs. Well, so much of what you just said resonated with me, particularly when it comes to trust and, and collaboration. You know, I started writing musicals because I really wanted to be in musicals and I didn't see that many opportunities for myself. I was like, you get, if you're a Puerto Rican dude, you get Paul in a chorus line, right. you get Bernardo. Right. Uh, and those are the shows that get done. It's like chorus line, West Side Story. That's right. like all Type we've cast. got. Yeah. Right. And I, I really started writing my first show in the Heights because I, I just wanted to write the kinds of roles I'd want to play. And, right. and Hamilton was a very similar deal. It was like, this is a 14 course meal for yeah. an actor. I get to fall in love, I get to win a revolution, I get to have an affair, I get to die in a duel. Like it's yeah. all the things, right? right? And, and, and creating that was an incredible joy, but it, it, the impulse was born out of you know, for me, just like you said, writing and acting, it's the same thing. The way your songs fed your acting, that fed more songs on set, um, they're, they're two sides of the same coin. You're, you're putting on the character, and when it feels honest, you write it down. Right. You know, you just write down the true parts. Right. And, and then when you're acting, it's the, you know, you're trying to get back to that impulse of being present and, and honest. And so when, when Rob Marshall came to me with this, Heart and and this incredible opportunity, it felt like the fruit of the harvest, you know, of the seeds I planted when I started writing right. in the Heights. It was like, oh, I, I don't have to write the whole thing, you know, and and we did a lot of pre-production. We had three months of pre-production on Mary Poppins Return. That's more than Broadway shows get. And so it was, in a way, it was it was a perfect first step for me because it felt like we were putting on a show. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like, all right, and previews, except your previews are. So it felt number. similar, the preparation process felt similar to putting on a Broadway show. Yeah, totally, totally. That's and also so Rob comes from theater. Right. Um, so, you know, he was an acclaimed choreographer, director before he ever made Chicago. And and so it was just a similar language. Um, and uh, so I, I just felt very comfortable and, and similar to what you said in terms of starting from naked and starting from vulnerability, Emily Blunt actually gave me the best advice on the first day because it was in my head, it was a big movie. Yeah. And he said, she said, Rob is paying more attention than we are. He's not gonna move on until he's got what he needs. Right. He's just not gonna move on until right. we've got it. So your only job is to sort of give him everything. Yeah. And, and that's the gig. Um, it is the gig. Welcome to our show of shows. It is my great honor to introduce this evening's renowned guest, the one, the only, Mary Poppins! Thank you, thank you very much. How do you find the difference between performing on set and, and, and when, you were, when you're filming this movie and when you're on stage at a stadium or at Glastonbury or the Coliseum. Well, you got to do a little of both in this movie. We did, but you know, what's interesting is that, you know, like when I'm performing on stage with my music, you know, there's this like tremendous connection with the audience, you know, and it's, it's different every single night. Yeah. And you know, you look out there and like, I'll be in a different city, but I'll recognize the same fans from yeah. years before that are still in the front row. It's the same, and, you know, it's the same in a it's show. The, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just, it's incredible and so, you feed off of the energy in the room and it changes, it changes every night. 
Um, you know, what I found working on film was, it was more that I was, uh, I was much more interested in being completely present with who I was communicating with yeah. on camera and uh, m very acutely aware that it was important for me to forget that there were cameras around me. Uh, because I, I'm not the, I'm actually the type of actress that uh, the director has to find me mm -hmm. because I will not do the, do this to like make sure they're getting the shot yeah. or cheat out. You know, I, I don't do that. I really, I really, once we start to go, I really am, the, I really was Allie. You know, yeah. so I, I, it's everything around me other than what is meant to be in the circumstances disappears. Right. Um, and I, I actually, I was, I just wanted to say I was, so astounded by your voice in oh, thank you. Uh, Mary Poppins because it is so different from your voice in Hamilton. And yeah. like, I just was like, how did he do that? And people ask me that question and I, I know intrinsically how I do it, but I, I'm, I wanna ask yeah. you that question, how did you do it? Well, I mean, this was the first time I'd ever really done like for real accent work, you know? And I, I know I pitched Hamilton very differently than I did Usnavi in my first show in the Heights. And I, like you, I know the difference is inherent in how right. just their tempo entering the world. It's right. really, I, I think of it musically. I think of it like, all right, what's this guy's tempo? Right. Um, you know, you, what's the rhythm? you see the, the guy cadence. walking down the street who's like this, and yeah. you see the people who are like, you know, tempo is right. where I start. Right. And, and for the accent work, um, the joy of it was that was another way in. That was just another way outside of myself and into somebody else. And I had this amazing dialect coach named Sandra Butterworth. And, and it was, at first it was like, are we gonna deconstruct every word I say in this movie? And what was way more interesting was actually just finding music you know, so I was listening to Anthony Newley. Mm -hmm. I was listening to like 1930s, like British music hall recordings mm -hmm. and really just digging into, all right, if this guy is a lamplighter in the 30s, and he's from the East End of London, like, and just the music was the easiest What would he in. be listening what to? What would he be listening to? I listened to a lot of Billy Bragg. Uh -huh. um, and, and it was really, the music was the easiest way. I was like, oh, got it. You know, it was, it was so much fun to, and then like learn about all this music I'd never listened to before. It was like a whole new, a whole uh, new world. world. Yeah, so it was that, was, that was a really fun part of the process. What have you done to your clothes? You could grow a garden in that much soil, and John, yes, yeah, just as filthy. How do you know our names? Because she's Mary Poppins, of course. May I say you look lovely as always? Do you really think so? When you were writing these songs, um, because like you said, like you, you wrote some of them before you started production. How much rehearsal did you guys have and how much did that feed into the um, music? We did not have much rehearsal time at all, if any, actually. Uh, the, the, the truth is that, so when we started the soundtrack, um, it was very important early on that you know, Jackson develop his sound. Yeah. Um, and that Bradley, you know, know what he, want, he wanted his sound to be. And for me, like, I was like <laughs> probably a very annoying gatekeeper. And I was like, all I want to do more than anything is throw myself in front of any human being that tells Bradley what he should sound like in this film. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he knew he wanted to lower and drop his voice. Right. So he, he had been working uh, with a, a teacher on that. Um, uh, but he, uh, sent me a song that was submitted for the film by Jason Isbell called Maybe It's Time. Mm. And that song set the tone. So I knew I knew that Bradley loved this song. So then when we went into the studio. Oh, that's cool. So we, that was like the Rosetta Stone. That yeah, was exactly. like what got you started. Yes, it was yeah. the nucleus. It was yeah. the nucleus. And th then uh, he introduced me actually to Lucas Nelson, Willie Nelson's son. And uh, Lucas was going to become Jackson's band. So when we were working in the studio, we were writing, but I was writing from the perspective of going, okay, so this is a girl that's singing, you know, you know, jazz tunes uh, or cabaret tunes, you know, in a drag club, and you know, she's singing the preamble of Somewhere Over the Rainbow. So she clearly yeah. knows a lot about theater. Uh, she loves music, uh, but when she meets Jack. You know what happens to her, right. and so how does that inform the mentors her music? It's so smart. Yes. Yeah. So what I did was is I worked with a lot of wonderful writers uh, because I wanted to have you know the force with me, <laughs> yeah. and, and not and not just be uh, what I would have seemed as 
you know, just kind of foolish and take it on all on my own. I, I wanted a lot of people's opinions. Yeah. Um, so I worked with a lot of different wonderful writers, um, Hilary Lindsay being one of them, Natalie Hemby, Aaron Rettier, Lucas Nelson, as I mentioned. Uh, I didn't work directly with Jason Isbell, but he sent us that song. And uh, Dave Cobb also worked with us on some production uh, for Always Remember Us This Way. And then uh, I wrote Shallow with Mark Ronson and Anthony Rosamundo and Andrew Wyatt. Uh, so basically what we did was I put this music, that, these songs, you, know, you make demos, you make songs, yeah. and then we filtered them through Lucas Nelson's band because that was Jax's band. So I knew because she would be on tour with him at some point that this would be her sound. So that's how I sort of navigated the process of how she, her sound would begin. Right. And, and also that's really smart. how she would change, you know, and uh, often in, I have found um, alcoholic relationships um, that there's sort of a, a taking on of the identity of the one that you're with. Yeah. Um, uh, it's it's a way to bond. Uh, it's a trauma bond. Uh, so I knew that that she would want to kind of uh, become a part of him in a way. Yeah. So that's how that started. And then when she meets Rez in the film, and he introduces her to you know these more commercial uh, songwriters and um, I'm sorry producers. Uh, I knew that I wanted it to drastically change. Yeah. And I knew that I wanted this to be a challenge for her. And this was exciting because, you know, we were sending songs, you know, you know back and forth. Bradley would send me songs that he wrote for Jackson, and mm -hmm. I would send him songs that I wrote for Ali, or songs that I'd written for Jackson, and he would come in and write on those songs. And it was, it was just a very interesting... Uh, collaboration because what ended up happening is that the, the, the music became a character in the film totally. because it's actually not a musical it's a movie about musicians that has music in it yeah. and so uh, I was so interested watching Mary Poppins because I was thinking wow this is so different because you know when we break out into the song into song in the, in the film it's because we are singing uh, on stage right and uh, or in a parking lot or in a, or in a parking <laughs> lot right exactly <laughs> But um, when you guys break into song, you know, I was noticing all like the little nuances in the film, like uh, the wind was blowing in the park and there were, the leaves were flying and it's magical. And then yeah. the man's top hat like flips back and then it flips back <laughs> right, on, right, right. you know, and then every, someone starts to sing. Yeah. And it's almost like you have to break into song and you have to break into song in that moment because you can't say it simply with words. So right. uh, I, I just found that very interesting. Yeah, it's, I mean, I, I always say Rob Marshall was sort of born in the wrong era. He would have been at home like making MGM musicals, like with <laughs> right. Jim Kelly and Fred Astaire because he has that thing. You know, I think it's, I think when we go into a theater to see a musical, we just suspend our disbelief. We're like, they're gonna break into song and like, we're here for it. Yeah. It's like full stop, it right. doesn't, and, and you can tell, you know, You'll hear an inappropriate laughter if, like, this transition into the song wasn't very smooth or really jarring. And it's a higher threshold in movies because we're here. Right. You know, the camera's here. Right. You know, for someone to break into song, you've got to be really smart about how yes. you do it so that it doesn't feel like it doesn't pull the audience but out I, of I it. But I noticed that in Mary Poppins, that, yeah. like, I, I noticed in the songs, um, there was one in particular when you were singing about the, the Leary. Yeah. And you were singing about the lights, right? But I noticed that as you placed things down and as you, oh, you yeah. you're, I, I could hear the foot go down. I could hear, you know, the hat hang on the, on the, on the side of the lamp. I could like, every, like I, and I wondered actually if you guys had uh, 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 recorded those pieces live or if those had been put in later. I think those were later because I, when I, I saw the movie for the first time last week actually, and <laughs> I've like just seen this movie <laughs> and what, knocked me out because Rob, again, he rehearses it like it's a show. So that big dance sequence around all the lamps, yes. we did that as an eight minute continuous number. There wasn't right. like cuts between each dance move. Right. It was like you rehearse it like you're doing the show in front of a live audience. Right. And then he just has 20 cameras on it and he gets the best right. stuff. Um, that's, so, that's sort of how we did it, except we didn't rehearse before. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the only rehearsal time that we had was when we sang the songs in the studio, recording them in prep for the Right. The uh, 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 the movie, but actually we sang live uh, every single time. Yeah, uh, and we did it with um, earwigs, mm -hmm. uh, so that we could hear the recordings, but that you would get a completely clean vocal on the mic, right. and then we would just shoot over and over again, continuous takes, so that he would have you know 
different things to pull from. Yeah. We it was interesting. Rob's whole thing is it's it's just got to feel as natural as possible. And so we would there were some sections that are live, like the beginning of that light song while I'm walking. That's all live because it's such a he's setting the tempo. Yeah. And we realized like if we put a click track on this, like it's right. not gonna work. Just invite them in, start the song, and right. we will. Get it? Amazing. Um, but then there was there was a great sequence where I'm biking in front of St. Paul's Cathedral. Uh -huh. and they were like, "Let's try a live take." And the the lyric is "Underneath the lovely London sky," and I we didn't factor in the cobblestones, so it was <laughs> "Underneath the lovely London sky." <laughs> you know, so there were some practicalities. Right, where but you that's cool. Play. Yeah, that's so cool. I love that. <laughs> yeah, so there was lots of fun stuff like that. You mentioned the the one that is the earworm is the maybe it's time to let the old ways. I mean, yeah. I it makes so much sense to me that that's the nucleus of the tune because also even the lyrics feel like it's tangentially ab about them and about Absol their capacity for change oh, or not to change. One hundred percent. I mean, and particularly for Bradley's character, I think you know, with with addiction and and yeah. the fact that he was battling that you know throughout the film, uh, you know, it's. Maybe it's time to let the old ways die. You know, it takes a lot to change a man. Hell, it takes a lot to try. Yeah. Maybe it's time to let the old ways die. I mean, that that really was the nucleus for uh, the soundtrack, and we're very grateful to Jason uh, yeah. uh, Isbell for writing that and giving it to us. And he's a really cool songwriter. He's one of those guys that like he writes the song and he sends it to you, and you know, I'll be like, hey, can we just change this one? No. <laughs> like, you got it. Like, like it, this is the song. Right. And. Um, but what was awesome is that we got to really draw from that, and you know, shallow, uh, shallow drew from that yeah. uh, as well because yeah, uh, you can feel it. It's yeah, because what what it set the stage for was a conversation. Right. And what I love about shallow in the film is that there, you know, he he surprises her with the first verse of the song, um, you know, when she comes on stage. Right. But you know, when they're writing in the parking lot, she's singing to him. Um, this is a conversation between a man and a woman, and he actually listens to her. And I think we live in a time when this is something that's really important to women. Women want to be heard. Yeah. And it's it's been kind of shocking and amazing to watch people la latch onto that song so much uh, because it's it's. I feel for me as an artist, maybe one of the most authentic uh, things that I've written. Um, yeah. Uh, and I, I feel I, I feel very like humbled and grateful uh, about that. And I, and again, like I have to throw it back to the team. You know, everybody from, you know, catering to grips to, you know, to Bradley to the producers. Uh, you know, everyone. Everybody was, you know, interested in getting to the most truthful and honest places that we possibly could. And it's so funny that you sort of mentioned listening because that's what struck me the most about that parking lot scene when they're when they're writing that is, it's actually not the takes of the two of you singing. It's the way Bradley listens to you, the way you listen to him when he's telling his story. Uh, that's those are the moments, and we so rarely see that, which is so strange. But I, I just I remember being like, wow, they're really listening to each other. Well, that's what's so meaningful, you know, to me to me also about people reacting to this film is that like, you know. It's it's relatively in, in, I mean, it's not low budget, but it's relatively low budget in in the scope of yeah. you know how much uh, uh, money is put into films nowadays, um, and yet it's had this commercial success and it's it's just kind of like really beautiful because I I know that it's connecting with every single person completely differently, yeah. and and that is really a special thing. Yeah, I started writing this song the other day. Watch as I dive in. The first number we shot for Poppins, I was coming off of Hamilton, and the first number we filmed was the animated sequence. It's it's me and and uh, and Emily, and we've got the hats, and we're imagining penguins around us, but they'll be there later. They'll draw them later. Um, and the first time. Oh, that's we, interesting. So there was no placeholders there. There were, uh, in some shots, uh, we would ha we had dancers who were holding up cardboard penguins. Uh -huh. uh, they're in like green masks, yeah, sort of like right. American Horror Story latex man, like right, just right. like green spandex, um, and they're holding <laughs> the penguins. And the first time we got through it, you know. 
four minute sequence and we do the whole thing and I climb the steps and like the crew's like, yeah, take five. Right. The cover is not the book. Yeah, I love that song. Yeah, okay, so can we move on? You know, so, and, the, and suddenly the applause is gone. Right. And, and so the fun for me was realizing, all right, well, what's the adrenaline source? Because I get so much adrenaline from the audience when I'm performing. Uh, in Hamilton or, or in a show, that connection you're talking about, you know, who's in the front row, you know, what's the energy, is this a matinee energy, is this like a, these right. people had this date circled in blood energy. Right. Um, and absent that, how do we do these musical numbers? You right. know, it, not so much scenes, but the musical numbers. And for me, the, the adrenaline source became, we're never going to be here again. You know, yeah. And reminding myself of that, like, we're not coming back to Buckingham Palace to, like, ride our bikes. Yeah. Like, and, and so, oh, that's so sweet. you know, it became this, like, that, that was, that's what fueled it. And, and that notion, and I feel like I, I can see it in the movie, this notion of, like, never going to be in front of these people with these guys holding up penguins. And that became the charge right. for me in terms of performing. What about you? You know, it was uh, it was such an interesting experience because for Ali, you know, she had not been on stage before, and this yeah. is the first time for her. So this was, and I love that close of you. It's just close on you as you're making the decision to right, go. Like to that's go. really one of the most thrilling sequences uh, in the film. Thank you. Um, you know, for me, in in that sequence in particular, you know, what I drew from, and I I don't like to draw from things during the uh, uh, f filming time, yeah. I'd like to draw from my deck of cards of all my experiences and my sen sense memory and my as ifs and everything. I like to draw from that before. I, I like to do my sorcery yeah. before I get to set. Um, but for that, you know, what was interesting is that I was like, oh, well, this could actually be quite simple. I've never been a lead actress in a movie before. <laughs> so I'm walking onto stage and I'm walking onto stage with Bradley Cooper, this huge, incredible film actor. So this is brand new. So I was able to kind of put myself in that circumstance a little bit more simply, yeah. like, and just kind of be there and be actually afraid. And it was, it was funny because <laughs> he was so kind. He asked um, uh, a lot of my fans to be extras uh, oh. For the scenes where we, there were fans in the audience. Oh, that's great! And uh, so you know, Shelley, our our first AD, who is incredible and amazing, who I love so much, uh, she would like you know come out and she would speak to everybody and she would say, um, "Whatever you do, please do not hold up any Lady Gaga signs." Because <laughs> uh, you're like a Glastonbury, yeah. or you're like at a festival, right? Yeah. And if you have a <laughs> cowboy hat, please make sure it's not pink because that looks like Joanne. <laughs> and uh, uh, and please uh, uh, do not scream Lady Gaga. Uh, if you want to ye yell after, please yell Ali. Uh, you know, just like, <laughs> yeah, you know, just like spiel, letting them like all know. And they're people. all going like, okay, okay, yeah, Gaga! You know, just, like, it was really <laughs> funny. We love you, we support you! <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it was, it, was, it was thrilling for me because I got to do something I have wanted to do my whole life. Yeah. which is be an actress. And I I got to do it for real. And I got to do it without all the armor that I've put on for many years. Right. Like for me, like I view a lot of the characters that I've built through my music as sort of an escape from my trauma. Mm. Trauma from childhood, trauma from, you know, mid-adulthood, yeah. you know, and sort of like, uh, shape-shifting so that I could shed the, the bad and move into a new. But with Ali, it was totally different. I had to take it all away. Yeah. And so I had to be in Ali's trauma, you know, but without all that armor. But something about acting, knowing that my fans were in the audience, it was quite exhilarating for me. I had to forget, of course, that they were my fans out there. But before I went on stage, you had to win them over in a weird way. Yeah, I had to win them over. But but before I went on stage, I would go like, my fans are out there, and they're watching me act in a movie, and that is my circumstance. My circumstance is that I'm doing something I've never done before, and then when I got out on stage, then they become people that I do not know, 
It becomes a stage that I do not know. It becomes a world that I do not understand. It, it, everything had to flip very wow. quickly. And all I had to trust in was my ability to sing and hope that when I did sing, that it would move people. And that's all that Ali really hoped for. Right. So, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is, you know, although I feel like Ali's still inside of me, and although I felt like I was in character, like most of the time when we made the film, there was also a moment of switching for me because I had to sort of, I had to witness myself um, creating that alchemy of what I would then bring onto stage and then stop thinking about, because you know the camera catches everything. Yeah. You know, it's like, if you are thinking about feeling sad on camera, you're, 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 you're gonna look <laughs> like you're thinking about feeling sad, you're not gonna look sad. Right. You know, so the, you're, you're, my objective always as an actress is for it to be actually real, yeah. you know? And, and, and um, uh, that's what I always found actually funny, even about when I did American Horror Story, is that, that um, I asked, used to ask people, I was like, I wonder like if people will think I'm not acting because they think that I'm just like this like heinous blonde bitch. <laughs> um, uh, and, and the Countess was so evil. Uh, and I'm, I'm actually nothing like the Countess, um, except that I'm, uh, you know, blonde <laughs> and like makeup and fashion. Uh, but, you know, so I guess what I'm trying to say is, is, you know, there is that flip back and forth and yes, there is that adrenaline that you were just talking about, yeah. of like really knowing where you are and what you're doing and yeah. knowing that it's not gonna happen again. And that, you know, the best thing that you can do is really be in the moment and right. be present and be the character and really like allow that character to live, yeah. give it life. So like I loved so much having my fans be a part of, you know, being the extras when Bradley and I were filming and we were singing and they were in the audience. And I know that you're very active on Twitter and that you have a relationship with your fans and so do I. So I just was wondering about that because I also really admire that you love kindness as much as I do and yes. promote that. <laughs> well, yeah, I, it's, it's interesting because I think I, you know, I got on social media like anybody else did. It was so sort of, I think the worst thing you could give me is an audience in my pocket. It's <laughs> <You're right. laughs> a dangerous thing to give to give a theater person. Yeah, you just perform constantly. Yeah, just oh hey, hello, good morning. Um, but the but the fun of that was I really the closest thing I have had to a diary um, is Twitter while I was writing Hamilton. It became a caffeine substitute for me. Wow. If I was up at three a.m. and I was knocking my head against a song, I would. Be like, hey, everybody, send me cute videos of cats. I'm like yeah. trying to figure out what George Washington's going to say in this moment. And I'm going to be right. up all night writing. Um, and it, I can look at tweets from 2011, 2012, 2013, and know where I was and what song I was working on. Because right. it took me seven years to write that. And then I think what happened was a after Hamilton, like the follower count just went crazy. And it became, well, what do I want to put into the world? Like right. I can't be on Twitter and like hate watch a show and tweet about it anymore because there will be an article about it. Right, right, right. <laughs> and so it becomes what do you want to put into the world and once you have a platform. Yeah, and and I I think of it as a literal megaphone. Um and mm -hmm. it, and that swings both good and bad. Like you can bring light to issues that you care about deeply. And if you use it 24 hours a day, everyone ignores the crazy guy on the corner with a megaphone. Right. You know, you can you can tune that out too. Right. Um, if you if you know, so if you use it sparingly and use it well, it can be very effective in the things you believe in. Yes. And so you know, I make a habit of just saying good morning and good night. I started that years ago, just as a way of clocking That's my own so office sweet. hours. <laughs> it was sort of That's like so sweet. And that way. I'm not at 3 a.m. on Twitter. I, I said good night already. I'll see you in the morning. See you good in the morning. morning. <laughs> yeah. It's just sort of like me. Like I think of those um, Warner Brothers cartoons where the the sheepdog and the wolf would clock into work every day. <laughs> They'd be like, morning, Sam, good morning, Ralph. Tw tweet, tweet in, tweet out. <laughs> tweet in, tweet out, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, um, but it's also just, uh, you know, I think that I, I feel like I get more kindness back because that's what I choose to put out in the world. And you, I mean, you're incredible uh, on social media and the way you, you rally your fans around causes that are important to you. I mean, you know, that's, that's an incredible thing, incredible way to use your voice. Well, you, you know, I honestly just, 
When I started to perform out in clubs and I was, I mean, doing like three shows a night, like I nonstop just traveling around the country, um, I would look out into the audience and I would see my fans and I was like, I'm pretty sure I'm looking at myself. Yeah. I'm not positive because I'm not talking to you right now. <laughs> I'm singing at you. <laughs> and, right. You know, I'm performing with and for you, but I'm pretty sure I'm looking at myself, but Twitter, for some reason, at that time, it gave me this opportunity to go like, oh, I am looking at myself, you yeah. know? Like, I always felt like an outcast. Yeah. I always felt like a loser. I always felt like I didn't belong. I always, you know, just was a misfit. And I'm not saying that all of my fans are that way, but there were so many of them that I couldn't ignore it. And I then saw very quickly, once my career started to take off, that, yeah, like you said, like there's this megaphone, and what am I gonna do with this megaphone? Right. Because, you know, if you have one, you should use it, and you should use it for good things. Yeah. And I, I work with my mom um, on the Born This Way Foundation, and we do a lot of philanthropic work, and it's you know all about empowering youth, inspiring them to create a kinder and braver world. And we do a lot of work around mental health and, um, you know, a pre a bullying prevention and things like that. Um, I work with my dad on stuff too. That's 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 another thing we have in common. So we're, we work with our parents we work and with our, our parents. philanthropy, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, you know, but what I have found with Twitter is is like, it's like this awesome thing that we can use and it's also a toilet. You know, yeah, fully. I mean, it's like at the same time as being able to use your platform for good things, there's also a lot of people that are using it for really bad things totally. and it can be totally dangerous. So I think the more that we like stick together and you yeah. know, promote the kindness and promote good things happening in the world, like I, I, I usually don't like to do this because I feel like when you do charity work, like having a camera crew with you or you know, showing people is like not, maybe it's the, it's the Catholic in me. It's like, it's I'm, not, it's I'm not black, selfless. I'm covering Catholic myself. Yes. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Is it right? But like, uh, since the California fires, like I, I went to a shelter and the first time that I went, uh, you know, I didn't take any photos with um, them for myself. I, I just, but I took photos with people that were there that wanted them. Yeah. And then the second time that I went, I, I was like, you know, I'm gonna post about this because, you know, I want people to know that, you know, it's important to do kind things, yeah. and that, you know, it's it's it doesn't matter who you are. You don't have to be me. You can be anybody, right. and you will lift people's spirits. Just people knowing that you care, and, you know, it was really amazing to see the family and the community that was built within these shelters during this time. I sure. mean, people are losing their homes, or they don't know anything about their homes, uh, or they're, you know, they can't reach their family members, and and are scared that they're not around anymore um so i think you know i think social media is one of those things that is you know, it's got the yin and the yang you know yeah. and it's like it's like i just want to always be on the side of kindness you yeah know? and i think and i really admire about you that you are the same way yeah likewise okay music check like big movie you're incredible in it check thank you so uh do you ever want to do eight shows a week <laughs> on broadway have you ever considered that check check i'd love that yeah oh yeah no. I mean, that was my like that was my dream. I mean, right. I think I've seen Rent probably thirty times. Well, Rent's the one that got me writing. Yeah, it w was. Yeah, I saw it for my seventeenth birthday, and I always loved musicals, but they never took place in the present. I I was just lost like, my mind. Yeah. when I saw <laughs> Rent, and I I used to go. You know, when you go really early. The twenty dollar and to get the twenty dollar yeah. tickets and like you stand in line and you put your name in and then they like call it like a raffle and like yeah they think, invented the lottery you, system yeah, yeah the, that I, I didn't know that and then you get to see you get to sit in the front row so you're yeah. just like right there like I'm like staring at Maureen as she's <laughs> like belted and I'm just like I just want to be Maureen and I remember that oh God, I, you grew up and you did become Maureen <laughs> well I well you, you know what's so funny is that I went to Cap Twenty One for at Tisch, the School of the Arts yeah. for like a year. And I was like being a bad girl and auditioning while I was in school, which we weren't supposed All to right, do. Right, sure. And I almost got cast in the uh, domestic uh, tour of Rent as Maureen, but I was too young. And, 
and then I quit school and decided to pursue a career in music because I was just I wasn't wasn't getting jobs as an actress. Um, yeah. But I I love Broadway. I mean, Broadway is. Oh, I mean. <laughs> I mean, I remember the first time I saw the Phantom of the Opera, I almost fell over. I mean, I've seen it multiple, multiple times, yeah. and, and that musical does not ever get old to me, ever. I mean, it's just it's just incredible. And I, I loved, you know, Sondheim, and I loved Fosse, and, uh, you know, I, I just, I've, I've always been a theater lover, lover. I mean, I would, I would absolutely do Broadway. Would you ever want to write for Broadway? You ever want to write a show? Yeah, I, I think I absolutely would. I was really inspired when I went to Circle in the Square, the mm -hmm. acting school. Yeah. When I was there, I actually thought about writing a musical called Circle in the Square and having it like be about, um, you know, uh, artists um, and, and actors and musicians and, you know, because that concept, that, that idea of putting a circle in a square, or you know, trying to you know fit a square through a hole, like yeah. th that whole idea, you know, it just, it just, I always found that so interesting. I, I remember I wrote one song for it, but I, I don't remember it at this moment. But um, yeah, that's something I would definitely love to do. And I, you know, why I know I could do it is because for many years, record executives told me I was too theater. To theater. Yeah, all like that's all they told me. Yeah, because they were like, they were like, you the beautiful. Any voice. record executive using theater as a pejorative, you know, you're dead to me, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wish I had you in the room with yeah. me. Yeah, during those times, I was just sort of sitting there going like, what's wrong with loving theater? Yeah. Uh, didn't Freddie Mercury love theater? <laughs> uh, I call myself Gaga because of the song Radio Gaga. Yeah, I mean, I, I was, I was, I loved theater. I thought yeah. the theatrics and in music was beautiful. I was obsessed with David Bowie, and I'm, you know, I, I can't be sure, but I can only be like slightly sure that he must have been obsessed with Lee Bowery, and you know, and you just go like, theater is just, and performance art, you know, the, these things are just like incredible, and I, I always wanted them to be a part of what I was making. So yeah, I would, I would absolutely, yeah, I, I and I actually, I, I kind of have an idea. Other than the we'll talk other than the, other than the circle and the square one, I, I do have an idea for a musical. Fantastic. Yeah. I want to hear more about that. Sing for us, Barry No, 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 no. Come on, have a go. No, I haven't sung in years. Sing for us, Mary Poppins. Do sing for us. No, I couldn't possibly. D flat major. Well, I loved Mary Poppins growing up, and I was like getting ready to watch your version of Mary Poppins. And I was going like, oh my God, like, what am I gonna do? Like, I'm so in love with the first one, what's gonna happen? And I'm sure people felt the same way watching A Star Is Born, because it's been remade three times and there's four, there's four versions of the movie. And I just, what I wanna know is, what was it like for you to play such a whimsical character after playing a, after playing Hamilton, because yeah. you know, that that character is so completely different. Yeah. And you know, the magic of Hamilton and the mo modernity of it and the innovation of the music and everything, it's so adjacent in a way. Not, and th it's not to say that, because what I, what I really loved about Mary Poppins was that it harkened back to Fully. old musicals. Like, and I was like, I was watching going, oh my God, thank God, like, this is awesome. Like, yeah. like, there was never a moment in the film that I thought that the music came in and it took me out of the scene. Right. Like, it just like, the magic all swirled into the song. So I'm just, I'm curious about, for you, what it was like to switch roles like that. I mean, beyond the dialect, yeah. beyond the, the change in the way you were singing, like, what was it like to go from creating something that was completely yours, working for seven years, maybe longer, yeah. on something that was not necessarily whimsical? Yeah. No, I don't think of and Hamilton and whimsy in the yeah, same sentence. Yeah. Right. Uh, but, yeah. how, like, how did you do that, and how did you make that transition, and... Because I will tell you, like, uh, there is no similarity to me. Like, yeah. as oh, as I, as watching it, I, I was astounded by your performance. I was going, like, wait, that's him? <laughs> like, it just, you just completely transformed. Oh, well, thank you. I, you know, it's, it's interesting. The, uh, it, it gets back to what you were saying. The, I know that Rob saw something in me because 
he asked Emily to play Mary Poppins, and then he asked me to be in this movie to play this new character. And we were the first two people on board. And the the joy of that, the joy of um, what I know about Jack the Lamplighter is that he is the only adult who understands that Mary Poppins is magic. Everyone else has forgotten. Even the Banks children, they're like, oh, Mary Poppins, you're back. Yeah, we made up that those adventures, right? Like yeah, they've, right. They've, they've written it off, they've rationalized it. And so all I know as an actor is, oh, no, 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 you don't understand. Like, Mary Poppins is coming. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and the magic is and, real. Yeah, and the magic is real. And that was liberating and also very easy to access for me because I get to be fully aware of how special it is to go on every one of these adventures. And you kids don't know yet, but you're gonna find out. And, and, and that was the thing that, that Rob kept talking about, that this is, Jack is an adult, but he is, he's the only one who hasn't lost touch with what it means to be a child. And the fact that we're all poets when we're children, and that we all run rampant with imagination. Which I'm going through it with my son now. My son is four years old. He has more imagination than I will ever have again, um, because it's your birthright when you're a child, right. and it fades as to you grow imagine. up. To imagine, yes. And so it was just tapping back into that. And I, you know, my son was two when we moved to London for a year to make this movie. And so I just had to look at him and, and I had it. Right. Um, you know, it was the, the greatest day on set was when we filmed that Triple Little Light Fantastic. The day before we filmed it, we had our last dress rehearsal and I put my son where the Banks children sit and he saw it in first person. Like, you all see that big edited fancy version, but right. he saw it as real as, and daddy and 40 lamplighters right. with you know, all of the, the spectacle and the look in his face is all I was trying to get in my performance, is the, the, that, that sense of imagination. Well, what was so incredible is that completely translated to me as well. Like, That's great. Like, I was watching it going, of course kids are gonna love this. But as an adult, I loved it so much yeah. because it reminded me like, wow, you know, as you get older, things happen to you, you yeah. know, and and we change. And our ability to dream somehow, it just, it, it doesn't mean we can't. It just sort of rotates and yeah. changes the way that we dream. Absolutely. And, and the scene when you guys jump into the bowl to get it fixed. Yeah. And you become a part of the painting that is on the bowl. I was thinking to myself, wow, you know, like, as a child, I would have looked at things like that totally. and I would have been like, oh, I'm, I'm riding in that carriage. And, totally. that, that, and it, it was exactly yeah. what I would have thought as a child. <laughs> and I had completely forgotten that that's how I would have felt as a child. Right. And that's what you guys gave me with this movie. And, the, and, and you really were her wingman. And, you know, because she's quite like, it's like, I, right. she, she, Mar Mary comes to do her job, and then when her job is done, yeah. she leaves. You know, and you, you really knew, you really knew sort of like the, the, the prophet save your life like aspect of Mary Poppins yeah. and you were really her her right hand man and yeah. it just it was it was so special and I just what did it feel like working with her with Emily uh, it was amazing she she had it I mean we did a so we did a week long workshop with just the script mm -hmm. about half a year before we started filming really to kick the tires on the songs figure it out and she walked in and it was there and yeah. She didn't watch the original movie. Oh, she didn't? No, she, I mean, she had seen it as a mm -hmm. child, like we all have, but she, she just- She didn't go back to she it. She didn't go back, she went to the books. And in the books, like, what's, what's great about Mary is she's an enigma. She's mm -hmm. vain, she's a little vain, she's imperious, she's tart. Um, and yet, she's totally selfless. Everything she does is for yeah. other people. Yeah. And, and, and that's the magic of her, of her performance is that when you watch it the second time, you realize even things you didn't think were part of the plan were part of the plan. She's guiding the little one to take the pieces of the shares and use them on the kite. Right. She's guiding Jack to bump into right. Jane Banks and for them to fall in love. Right. She's guiding, it's not just the big mission, no, it's she's, all the side yeah, missions. She, she's so sort of godlike. Yeah. 
And, uh, you know, we have that in common um, because Bradley and I did workshops before we started filming. Yeah. We did uh, one with Elizabeth Kemp. We did a dream workshop. And then we also worked with Susan Batson and uh, went through the entire script, and she was there on set with me every day. Um, but in the dream workshop that I did with Elizabeth Kemp, I'll never forget it. I was laying on the floor. And she said, I want you to go back in your in your mind and in your heart and in your body, I want you to go back to a time in your life where life blasted you so hard mm. that you can't remember who you were before it happened. Wow. And it just made me sob. And sure. I was I was laying on the floor and I was sobbing. And you know, it goes back to your earlier question about trust. You know, yeah. that's what built the trust. And I think I'm sure I can only imagine that must have built the trust between you and Emily as well. It's yeah. just because when you, when you're in that 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 depth, you know, I, I have this uh, this theory that I've been actually taught by a great teacher who's a friend of mine, uh, and he talks about it's it's a theory in meditation that you know all of our worries and all the things that are swirling around in our minds they're the waves on top of the ocean, yeah. but that. Uh, in the center of the ocean, when you when you dive deep down, it's completely still. Mm. You know, so what I think is so interesting is when you sort of you begin in the stillness, and you begin in the depth, and then you slowly rise with your partner, your, with who you're in the scene with. You slowly rise to the top, and allow those waves to crash and see where they take you, and it's different every time.